Welcome. This is an update to the activity levels of Solar Cycle 25 for October of 2022. One of the things we have to remember when looking at the sun is that it is a variable star. Over a period of about 11 years, the sun goes through a cycle of high and low activity. That activity is mainly characterized by changes in the number and size of sunspots, the number and intensity of flares, and the number of coronal mass ejections that we see. These changes can affect the Earth in a number of different ways in a discipline called space weather. Let's talk about some of the space weather effects. A lot of people are unaware of how much variations on the sun can actually affect our daily lives. One of the major effects is a geomagnetic storm. They produce aurora, radio interference, and even power outage because induced currents can actually affect the grid systems, particularly at high latitudes. They can damage satellites through spacecraft charging, which can destroy electronic parts. Data loss, because you, the radio signals from the satellite are degraded for, by the space weather effects. Image degradation, particles hitting the focal plane of a detector produces a snow effect, so you don't get such good images. And in extreme events, when the magnetosphere is compressed, satellites, depending on magnetic pointing, can actually lose their pointing accuracy. Extreme events at high latitudes can cancel transpolar flights, say from New York to Beijing, and have to have them rerouted through more southerly air airports like Alaska or something of that sort, which costs the airlines a great deal of money. And something that a lot of people don't realize is that your GPS can become more inaccurate because of scintillation of the ionosphere due to space weather. We have accumulated over 400 years worth of sunspot data and it's shown here. And you can see that there's a pattern to the data and that's the 11 year uh, sunspot cycle. Now the red data on the left is a bit spotty so we don't trust that data as much as the blue data. The blue data are the 25 solar cycles that we've monitored so far. Now we have to explain of solar physics why there's so much variability here you have the Maunder minimum where there is nearly no sunspots for 70 years. We have the Dalton minimum where there are a couple of solar cycles that are very low. And we have several periods of maxima in the late 18th century, in the middle of the 19th century, and in the middle of the 20th century. And so that's the, the job of the solar physicists that uh, look at solar cycle effects. Looking at that past pattern, you'd think that solar cycle is fairly easy to predict. We have 400 years worth of data and you should think that we would have the uh, prediction of these cycles well established by now, but we don't, they're hard to predict. And the reason is that the average cycle is about 11 years, but the variation in that is plus or minus three years. And it seems to be relatively random. Average peak sunspot number is about 180, but again, it varies from anything from zero, like during the Maunder minimum to 290, which is the highest peak we've had so far. The average sunspot number at minimum is nine, but it varies by a factor of two between zero and 20. So even predicting the sunspot number at minimum is fairly difficult. Even at the moment, some people are predicting that very soon we're going to go into a new Maunder minimum, a new grand solar minimum. I take this with a great pinch of salt and think it's unlikely for reasons that will become apparent as we're going through this presentation. Let's take a look at the last one and a half cycles of solar data and see what we can understand from that. This is solar cycle 24 on the left here. And on the right, you can see the beginnings of solar cycle 25. We're during the rise phase of solar cycle 25 at the moment. There are three different measures of sunspot number here. The yellow is the daily sunspot number. You can see it's highly variable, varying by factors of two in just a day or two. The blue curve is the monthly average sunspot number. There's a little bit more consistency there, but there's still quite some large variations from peak to peak. And then the red curve is what's called the smooth sunspot number. That's a 13 month averaged sunspot number. And you can see it's quite smooth. And that's the one that's used to parameterize solar cycles. So the peak of the solar cycle is determined by the smooth sunspot number. And the minimum is also determined by the minimum in the smooth sunspot number. On the left, you can see two dash curves, which are predictions based on different types of models of the solar cycle. 
And even though we're only a two to three years away from the maximum, you can see the two models, the two best established models are varying quite considerably in their predictions. The dash curve is showing a maximum of just over 120, whereas the dot and dash curve is producing a maximum of at least 175. So even though we're very close to solar maximum, the models still don't agree as to what the maximum will be. And this is part of the difficulty of predicting a solar cycle. Let's take a detailed look at the smooth sunspot number. This is from the minimum between solar cycles 24 and 25. So this is basically solar cycle 25 evolution. And you can see that the curve is still going up and it's actually accelerating still. So I think that the higher of those models of the solar cycle or predictions of the solar cycle will be uh, more accurate than the uh, lower one of the two. There's another way of looking at the solar cycle. NASA and NOAA get together every 11 years or so and predict what the next cycle will be. This is shown in red here. At the top curve, we're predicting the sunspot number from that panel with the current activity in solar cycle 25. And you see solar cycle 25 is vastly outstripping that particular cycle. If that is continued for the 11 years, we would end up with a cycle that is 190. Another measure of solar activity is the F 10.7 centimeter radio flux. And that too is doing a similar sort of thing. And if that is continued through to 2025, we would have a solar cycle of about 180. There's one peculiar thing that seems to be going on with the sun at the moment, which I've called a tale of two suns. On the left, I have a picture of the sun that was facing the earth on 9th of October, 2022. And you can see that there are no sunspots in the Northern hemisphere. There are a few sunspots in the Southern hemisphere. In fact, in the previous few months, we've had quite a lot of sunspots in the, the Southern hemisphere, but that seems to be less now. Two weeks later, i.e. the other side of the sun shows that there's an awful lot of sunspots in the Northern hemisphere and none in the South. It's like there's two different things going on in the two different hemispheres. There's another way of telling how far we are through the cycle. When a cycle starts, the sunspots start at very high latitudes and slowly migrate as the sunspot cycle progresses towards the equator, eventually fizzling out as the last sunspots of that cycle reach the equator. At that point, new sunspots appear at high latitudes and start the next cycle. So we, all we need to do is to track where the sunspots are as a function of time to see where we are in the cycle. And we're, the sunspots at the moment are at about between 15 and 20 degrees north. So they're about halfway through the cycle, as I was saying. One of the things that people don't realize is that sunspots are magnetic. That's why they appear dark. The photosphere is at a temperature of about 5,700 degrees Kelvin because hot gases are rising from the hotter inner layers of the sun and reaching the surface. The strong magnetic fields in the, in the sunspots, 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, inhibit some of that motion. And so not so much energy is reaching the surface and consequently they are not emitting so much light so they appear darker by contrast. Now, if you were to pick a sunspot off the surface of the sun and put it up in the sky, it would be brighter than the moon. But nonetheless, by contrast, it appears dark. So it's important that we look at the magnetic fields and see what's going on. So we must look at the, the magnetic field of the sun. And this is a picture of the magnetic field. In this picture, yellow is positive magnetic field. Blue is negative magnetic field. And you can see these four cycles here showing the butterfly diagram uh, structure that I showed you before. In the first one of these, you can see in the northern hemisphere that positive field is leading and negative field is trailing. In the other hemisphere, it's the other way around. But note, while in the northern hemisphere, the positive field is leading, the polar region is also positive field. But you can see that the negative field from the trailing region is exported to the polar regions and eventually cancels that field and builds up the opposite polarity. At solar maximum, the field about reverses. So that's another way of looking at where we are as far as the maximum is concerned. When you see the polar fields disappear, then you are approximately at solar maximum, and we're nowhere near that yet. Now the next cycle is reversed with negative leading in the northern hemisphere and positive trailing, and the northern hemisphere polar regions uh, negative, and in the southern hemisphere it's the reverse way round. And this 
cycle repeats every two uh, sunspot cycles. So we have a 22 year magnetic cycle. There are other cycles that people postulate. And one of them is the 88 year Gleisberg cycle. This is a period of 88 years where the uh, maximum minima is supposed to be defined by this uh, of four solar cycles. Now, I've marked here referencing one time or another as uh, the maximum or the minima and marked off 88 year periods. And it doesn't look to me that anything cleanly lines up with any of these particular markers. So the Gleisberg cycle, as far as I'm concerned, is something either that needs to be established or is just plain isn't true. There's another cycle that people like to consider, which is a 400 year cycle. And that is the origin of the grand solar minimum that I talked about earlier. They were about 400 years on from the Maunda minimum. So we should be going into a grand solar minimum now. However, if you look at the 400 year periods that I've put on here, it doesn't seem to hold a great deal of water. There is a, a model produced by Zarkova shown here, which allegedly reproduces the 400 year cycle. However, I think it was assumed and put into the model rather than derived from the data because she only considered 30 years worth of data. And that doesn't make any sense to me mathematically. Let's take a look at another activity indicator, flares. They are the sudden release of magnetic energy. They produce a sudden isotropic burst of radiation. That means it goes in all directions. Those, that radiation could be gamma rays, X-rays, extreme ultraviolet, ultraviolet and radio waves. At X-ray wavelengths, the sun can suddenly become 10,000 times brighter because of one flare than it is normally. Flares are generally associated with the strongest magnetic fields, i.e. sunspots. The bigger and more dynamic the sunspots are, the bigger and more likely we get large flares out of it. Let's take a look at flare categories, and they are characterized by the amount of X-ray flux they produce. C flares produce a flux between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6 watts per meter squared. M flares are 10 times larger, and X flares are 10 times larger than that. We've had X flares as large as X47, so that X flare is 4,700 times brighter than a single C flare. In this picture, you can see we have a large number of C flares, and there's one M flare marked there at, on the beginning of November 7th, and that, i.e., that was just a few days ago. That was an M5 flare. Let's see how C flares between solar cycle 25 and solar cycle 24 are compared. The orange curve here is solar cycle 25. The blue curve is solar cycle 24. You can see that we've got a vast increase in the number of C flares from solar cycle 25 over solar cycle 24 so far. Now we'll take a look at the next highest category. This is M flares. This is 10 times brighter than C flares. And again, solar cycle 25 is outperforming solar cycle 24. Lastly, we'll take a look at X flares. And uh, solar cycle 25 is at least two X flares ahead of solar cycle 24 at this stage. That's not very much, but then again, X flares are very uh, rare offense. And we've only had nine so far this cycle, and we only had seven so far in the last cycle at this stage. Next, let's take a look at coronal mass ejections. That's the sudden release of magnetic energy, just like for flares, but instead of producing a pulse of, uh, of radiation, they produce a huge mass of coronal plasma expelled from the sun. These velocities can be anything from 200 to 4,000 kilometers per second, and they're of limited size and directional. They're not isotropic like flares, so not all of them hit the Earth. In fact, not many of them hit the Earth, thank goodness. Now let's take a look at the numbers of CMEs comparing solar cycle 25 to solar cycle 24. Solar cycle 25 again is the orange curve and it's outperforming solar cycle 24 quite significantly. So once again, we have an activity indicator indicating that solar cycle 25 is much more active than solar cycle 24. Lastly, we'll take a look at uh, active regions. These are areas of solar activity associated with sunspots. And the larger ones are numbered by NOAA and so I'm keeping track of the ones that NOAA has particularly numbered and comparing solar cycle 24 at this stage with solar cycle 25. Once again, solar cycle 25 is outperforming solar cycle 24. Not quite as spectacularly as with some of the other activity indicators, but nonetheless, quite significantly so. In summary, all the solar activity indicators so far 
show that solar cycle 25 is outperforming solar cycle 24. If the trend continues, solar cycle 25 will be significantly larger than solar cycle 24. Therefore, there's no indication that we're going into a grand solar minimum because you'd expect solar cycle 25 to be much smaller and weaker than solar cycle 24, if that were the case. This is a particularly exciting time to be observing the sun. So thank you for watching. Stay safe until next time and goodbye.